The Blind Date by K.B. Hurst I met Aubrey after signing up for one of those lunch meetup websites. We agreed to meet at a little cafe in the city that was close to both of our jobs. My matchmaker, Jan, gave me a little bit of a background on Aubrey. She was 29, worked not far from my office, and was in marketing. <laughs> Who wasn't in marketing these days? I stood by the door to the cafe and waited for her to arrive. At 12 o'clock precisely, she walked into the cafe, and I immediately felt attracted to her. Aubrey was a tall, athletic blonde with green eyes. She had flawless skin that was tanned to a perfect glow. I felt like I was being pranked when she and her supermodel looks walked over to me and introduced herself. Hello, you must be Max. She smiled. Hey, yeah, um, it's very nice to meet you. I said trying to appear more outgoing than I usually was. I was in my late 30s and standing at 5 feet 10 inches. I was just a bit shorter than she was in her heels. I wish I had stuck to that diet over the holidays. I felt myself sucking in a bit in front of her. Aubrey held out her hand and I took it in mine. She smiled, showing off her pouty mouth and perfect white teeth. We got a table near the window overlooking the busy city street. The waiter came over and took our orders. She had a salad and I ordered only a coffee. No time like the present to start that diet back up. I'd be at the gym later today. So Max, uh, tell me about yourself. She smiled, and when she did, she played with a long gold necklace that disappeared into her cleavage. I tried not to stare. I work over, uh, I work in finance uh, over at Blakely. Oh, that's very close to me. I'm just a block up at Gamal. Too bad we never met on her own. Instead, we had to hire matchmakers. She smiled, tossing back her long blonde hair and blowing her bangs out of her eyes. Um, yeah, you seem perfectly adequate to find a date on your own. Not like me, I'm a bit chubby and too many lines around my face now, I joked. Aubrey shook her head. <laughs> you aren't chubby or old looking. I'd say rugged in a good way. She winked at me. Is this the first time you've tried to find romance using a uh, matchmaker? I asked, trying to make small talk. Well, I used one several years ago, but I recently got back on the market after my fiancé Pete and I called off our wedding. How about you? Uh, you might say I've tried everything. Tinder, Twitter, Facebook, OkCupid. Okay uh, what's the one with the fish? Plenty of fish? She laughed. Oh, and uh, Christian Mingle, too, I said, now full-on red-faced. Are you religious? Aubrey asked. Yeah, no, not at all. I'm trying to something different. I'm a bit embarrassed about it now, I said sheepishly. <laughs> There's no need to be embarrassed. I found you, so now you can relax. She winked again and giggled. She was flirting with me. With me? I had hit the lottery with her. I'd hoped we'd make it a good enough impression that we'd turn our lunch into a dinner date. Aubrey and I spent 45 minutes talking over lunch, and then we both had to head back to our offices. I got back to my office and saw I had missed call from the matchmaker, Jan. I didn't want to talk right then. I'd follow up with her later. After each date, I had to check in and Jan would tell me what my date thought of me and if we would be setting up a second date. It was then and there I realized that I didn't plan on complying. I was going to cheat and ask Aubrey out myself. Only thing, I stupidly forgot to get her number. I stopped what I was doing and looked up the name of the marketing firm she worked at. Grim, was it? No, that wasn't it. I did a search for names in a five mile radius. Camel marketing and advertising. Ah, yes, I've got you now, I said to myself. I picked up my phone and called. A receptionist answered in an unfriendly manner. Camel marketing and finance, how can I direct your call? I need to speak with Aubrey Matthews. Um, I'm sorry to say I don't have her extension. The phone clicked and then began to ring. 
I expected the receptionist to say, one moment, or be right with you. Instead, she simply put me through. Aubrey speaking, how may I help you? Her voice was as beautiful over the phone as it had been two hours ago in person. Could it be possible that I was already falling in love with her? Aubrey, this is Max from lunch. I, I know we said we'd go through Jan, but I thought we really connected and, well, what the hell? Would you like to have dinner with me? <sighs> there was a sigh, and I began to think she was going to say, hell no. But then she surprised me. <laughs> oh my gosh, absolutely I'd love to go to dinner. <sighs> I can't see you tonight, though. I'm meeting some friends. How about Friday? Perfect. Aubrey has accepted, and I was ecstatic. I even bought a new shirt and a tie for the occasion. We agreed to meet at a beautiful Italian place around the corner. After we ate dinner, we ended up back at her place. I don't want to get into details, but she was everything I ever wanted in a woman. She was vibrant, sexy. We made passionate love like there was nothing else in the world that mattered besides us. I'd say about four weeks we dated and then something changed. Aubrey stayed the night at my house, which at this point was pretty standard. We went into work before her and she always went before me and my apartment was closer to her office. So it made sense. I rolled over and got up shortly after she left. I showered and then grabbed my bagel she'd made before she left. I dressed in a hurry and took a taxi to my office. When I arrived at work, my boss met me at the door. He looked angry, but I wasn't entirely sure why. I need you to come with me. I followed him, feeling confused as to why all the seriousness. Then I saw it. All over my door, my walls, my desk were photos of Aubrey in multiple com compromising positions. I laughed. What is this? I asked him. That's what I'd like to know. Sir, I have no idea how these got here. Clean it up, Max. Make sure this little practical joke doesn't happen again. I nodded. I pulled out my phone and texted Aubrey. <clears throat> uh, thanks, babe. But, uh, what the hell? One photo would have been enough. My boss saw and didn't appreciate it. I received a response back. It was one little photo. Your intern let me in. I chuckled to myself. One photo copied and hung like wallpaper. Cute, and I appreciate it, but I don't want to get fired. She texted me back. I only left one photo on your desk with a box lunch. I texted her the photo of my office. She responded. I didn't do that. I laughed to myself. It's all good. I'm, I'm not mad. When I got home from work, Aubrey was at my place in a panic trying to explain she didn't take all those copies of that photo, even going so far as to say how embarrassing it was. I reassured her that it was okay. Someone at the office was probably just playing a prank on me. And I dropped it. All was forgotten. And then a week later, I was home alone. Aubrey was out of town, supposedly with friends at a wine retreat, when I heard something outside. Getting up off my sofa, I peered out my patio doors and looked over my balcony to see my neighbor's trash can had been knocked over. Figuring it must be raccoons, I went back to my spot on the couch, thinking absolutely nothing of it. Eventually, I began to doze off. So I turned off my television and retired to my bed. At some point, I woke in the middle of the night to something moving around my bedroom. I sat up, turned on my bedroom light, but nothing was there, so I rolled over and fell back to sleep. The next morning, I woke up, and that's when I noticed something strange. On my kitchen counter was one of Aubrey's hair scrunchies. I know this sounds weird, but... 
My house was clean and there was absolutely nothing on my kitchen counter the night before. Not to mention Aubrey never even left a toothbrush in my apartment in the month we'd been dating. It was a minute detail, but one I noticed. The following Monday, Aubrey spent the night and we watched movies. We always had a great time and I had fallen rather quickly for her. There was nothing about her that made me feel uneasy. Tuesday rolled around and I had to meet a client, Jolene Somerville, at my home. It was perfectly innocent. I had known her for 10 years. She had been my client. Nothing other than a handshake had ever become between us. We went over paperwork and she had signed some legal documents. Pretty boring stuff. I usually didn't entertain clients in my home, but as I said, she was a client I had had for 10 years. She didn't have time to go into the office because she worked long hours, so I offered to see her at my place. We were sitting on my sofa when the sliding glass door shattered into a million pieces. The glass had shattered so hard that we both had shards of glass all over us. I stood up to see why it had happened. As I leaned over my balcony, I saw someone running away. I couldn't make out who it was. I filed a police report that night, and poor Mrs. Somerville had to stay for questioning. Did I know who had done it? No. Had I pissed someone off lately? No. The police gathered it was mostly kids or something messing around. Then the next morning I was walking to my car and I happened to notice a photograph lying next to my neighbor's trash can. I picked it up and realized it was a photo of Aubrey. I thought it was strange that it was on the ground outside my apartment. Something didn't feel right suddenly where she was concerned. First there was the office incident with the photos, then her pink scrunchie on my counter, then when I was with a female client that bricked through my window. It had to be Audrey doing all of these things. Why? I didn't have the answers, but I confronted her with everything that had happened since we started dating. I asked Aubrey to meet me, ironically, in the same cafe we met the first time. She sat across from me wearing a long white dress and long brown boots. Her hair had just been highlighted recently, so it had a certain golden glow that she knew I loved. Aubrey looked at me with her serious green eyes, and I tried to find the words to even comfort her. Finally, I mustered up the courage and came out with everything that had happened over the last five weeks or so. I told Aubrey about the weird hair scrunchie I found in my apartment when no one had been there the night before. The brick and the uneasy feeling I had when I saw her photo the morning after the brick incident. Max, how can you even suggest such a crazy thing? I can assure you that I had absolutely nothing to do with any of those things. I still hold to the truth of that morning I left you a surprise photo in your office. It was just that one photo. I realized that was probably stupid of me, but I was trying to be sexy and flirty. I wasn't home the weekend you said you found my hair scrunchy. I'd have had to break into your house, not to mention I trust, I trust you and would never become so jealous that I'd throw a brick through your window. That is insane. I don't know why you found my photo outside your door. I don't know why any of this is happening. Well, Aubrey, I'm not crazy either. I really don't think we should see each other any longer. My word was crushing and yet final. I could see the hurt and the anger in her face. She stood up, threw a small box on the table. This was going to be your Valentine's Day gift. Take it anyhow. It will remind you of what a crazy jerk you are. I'm not trying to hurt you, Aubrey, but all this is kind of weird. Even you have to admit it. If you could prove to me in some way that you never did any of those things, I'd feel better. I shouldn't have to prove shit to you, Max. You should know me well enough by now that I would never do any of those weird things. You know, you sound exactly like my ex, Pete always accusing me of crazy shit. To think I settled for you. What's that supposed to mean? When I said you were ruggedly handsome, I was being nice. Let's face it, you do need to work out more. It might help with your next blind date. Andre stopped off. As I watched her go, I felt a tinge of hurt and regret. It had to be done though. 
The thing with the office photos should have been the first sign that she was off. A week passed by, and I didn't hear from Aubrey. I don't know why I expected to. I guess I thought she would find a way to prove to me she never did any of those weird things. So wanted it to not be true. Friday night came, and some of the guys from work invited me out. I declined the invitation because I didn't feel up to it. The thought of trying to find a date after Aubrey was way too much. Let's face it, I'd never find anyone as good looking or as perfect as she was. Well, as perfect as I believed her to be. Instead, I settled in for the night with a six pack of beer and a Chicago pie pizza. As usual, I watched about a half hour of television and then I dozed off. I woke up to the sound of my television. It was a scary movie, there was screaming. As I sat up to turn the volume down on my TV, I saw him. My sliding glass door to my living room was directly across from my couch, and in the doorway of the sliding glass door was a figure. The person was at least six feet tall, was wearing all black, and the scariest part of all, he was wearing an expressionless white mask, something you'd see in that movie Eyes Wide Shut. The figure held up their hand and waved to me slowly. The person slowly slid the sliding glass door open and then walked into my apartment. I never kept it locked because it was on the second story. Now I wish I had been smarter. The masked man was about four feet away from me when I saw him pull out a large butcher knife. I shot up like a bat out of hell and ran towards my bedroom. I thought I could at least lock myself inside until I figured out what to do next. Before I could even reach the door to my bedroom, I felt the knife. I was stabbed in my back. I kept running as the stranger was trying to get the knife out of my back, and I kept moving. Blood was everywhere. I could hear the sound of the knife leaving my flesh. Luckily for me, it was just under my right shoulder blade and nowhere near my spine. I got to the door and managed to get inside my bedroom just as his head was coming through the door. I saw his mask fall off of his face, and there revealed the face of my assailant. It was a younger guy, probably late 20s or so. He was a big man, and his large hands were now fighting to keep the door open. I was struggling with everything in me to try and close the door on him. He was bigger than me, and I used every ounce of strength inside of me to fight him off. How dare you! He yelled at me as he struggled to get through. I heard a phone ringing. It distracted us both suddenly because it was loud. I looked down and could see that he had dropped his phone behind me. I mustered up enough courage to slam the door shut. I locked it as fast as I could, and he was still trying to get in. I quickly picked up the phone and dropped it. My hands were now covered in sticky blood from my wounds. I picked up the phone just as I could see the door was about to crack open. <sighs> Cheap wooden frame. He was screaming at me. She loved you and you hurt her. You'll never see her. Tomorrow after what you did to her. I ran towards my bathroom just as I reached a 911 operator. I quickly explained the situation, and luckily for me, the cops arrived quickly. He was just breaking past the door to my bedroom when I heard sirens. Then I heard cops outside my apartment door. I stood still, afraid of leaving the bathroom, but I didn't hear him outside the door screaming anymore. Then I heard the door to my apartment open with a tremendous bang. They apprehended the man quickly. I walked out into the living room to where I was met with two officers who helped me sit down. I heard more sirens and soon an ambulance was inside my apartment. Neighbors were in the hallway watching everything that was going on. As they took the man away, he was still shouting at me. She loved you. She fucking loved you. She's, she's mine and she, you can't hurt her again. I learned the identity of the man was named Peter Odell. Peter was Aubrey's ex fiance I learned that he had photos of us together. One chilling photo was of her and I in bed together sleeping. Peter was the one that had been breaking into my apartment. He must have followed Aubrey to my place as I learned she had a restraining order against him for stalking her. <laughs> Funny, she didn't seem to think that was an important thing to mention to me. Even after I accused her of all of those things, she never once told me about her, their violent history. If I had known, we could have maybe gone to the cops together. I could have gotten my locks changed. 
I learned that he had used one of my neighbor's garbage cans to climb up to my apartment at some point, and had entered that way. Always lock your doors, kids, so I've learned. I had to testify against Peter for attempted murder. That was the last time I saw Aubrey, too. She was called in as a character witness because of the restraining order. His lawyer was trying to get a reduced sentence, saying he had suffered from a mental breakdown after Aubrey broke up with him. Aubrey testified that Pete had always been violent. That's why she called off the engagement. It worked and got him six years. Not nearly long enough for my peace of mind, but it was better than nothing. I reached out to Aubrey after, but I never got a response. If I learned anything from this, it's to be more open and a better communicator. Now, if you will excuse me, I have another blind date tonight to get ready for. My date's name is Susan, and Jan says she works.